On today's Locked On Thunder podcast, we're joined by Mavs Draft on Twitter, Richard Stamen, to talk about the 2023 NBA Draft. Let's look at some interesting college prospects entering conference play, but also discuss how do you even begin to evaluate the Thompson Twins who are playing at Overtime Elite. We'll get into all that and more coming up on today's Locked On Thunder podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder Podcast, on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member, media member and editor-in-chief over at thunderousintentions.com. Ryland Styles. you can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunderpod. Email the show, LOThunderpod at gmail.com. On today's show, we're going to dive into the 2023 NBA Draft, talk about some key names to watch in the college basketball season as conference play rolls around. We're going to start with Cam Whitmore, go to Brennan Miller, and so many more. Plus, I want to discuss Overtime Elite and talk about uh, how to evaluate the Thompson twins as well, but we are joined by the draft expert himself at Mavs Draft on Twitter. But in our hearts, he's Thunder Draft as he has adequately changed his display name on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, go subscribe over there and see Richard Stamen with that display name Thunder Draft now. Richard, how are you doing today? You know, um, which hat do you want me to wear? My Mavs Draft hat or my Thunder Draft hat? Either or. It's the same answer. Today's a great day. You know, we're coming off the uh, the Thunder losing, helping their stock in the draft lottery uh, to a team who who knows who they lost to. Really good day, I would say. Really good day. You were in attendance for that game in the AAC. You had some great seats as well. What was your impression of this scrappy Thunder team? Well, I want to uh, first apologize. It was my first time seeing Jeremiah Robinson Earl in person, and he got hurt. So uh, clearly I'm a curse, even though I've been like his number one fan for the last two years, three years even. So I apologize for my actions. Um, I want to address that. But on the real, I, I had one very uh, just prominent thought, I guess, which is Jalen Williams is legit. That guy, like, I, I think, I know Thunder fans know what they got with him. He's very good. But nationally, like, this might be the best kept secret in the NBA. Like, he is a three-level scorer, 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, whatever he is. No defense phases him at all. Uh, they put, I mean, Reggie Bullock's the best defender on the team. He made him look like garbage half the time. Like the way he gets to his spots, he gets to the rim, he gets pull up jumpers. You can't, if teams start to even sag off of the shot, he makes them pay. Or, or you know, if they're trying to defend the drive, defend the shot, he goes the other way. Like his counters for what defense does, defenses do. And that's not even like the individual moves, just like the game plan he has mentally is so advanced. He plays like a fourth year player already. And he's a rookie. Like I love everything he brings, brings to the table. I love J dub Jalen Williams out of Santa Clara, not Arkansas, which is what your PA guy messed up yesterday, but you are right to circle back you. I think that you are the biggest Jerry supporter. That's not in the Robinson Earl family. You had Jeremiah Robinson Earl ranked 12th on your big board entering his draft. And of course he goes high in the second round and the thunder, uh, have a very good second round pick, but you, I feel bad that you did not get to watch him in all of his glory yesterday because of that injury. Uh, but you were very high on him. And, and if we're going to do these victory laps, that's one that, that I think that you can take from that draft class is that you knew Jeremiah Robinson was going to be an NBA player. And he's been uh, very good this season, shooting better from three. Obviously we, we knew that he could shoot from three, but now they're actually falling instead of just looking pretty, which is good for Jeremiah Armstrong. Hopefully that that injury is not too bad. We'll get an update on that, you know, tomorrow before the heat game. Um, they, they're not going to practice today on the, on the, uh, on Tuesday after that long road trip, they're going to have the day off. I'm sure. So Richard, we're here talking about the draft and I want to get your thoughts on this aspect of the, th of the, uh, Thunder too, because you're someone who evaluates these draft classes a year ahead of time, two years ahead of time. So you're pretty intimate with how this 2023 draft class looks. And we've both talked to people who think that, you know, this draft class is loaded with, with top tier talent. I've heard, you know, seven, eight guys deep of, of players who people think can be a top three member of an organization. With that being said though, what is your opinion on how the Thunder 
should handle this season. If I put you in Sam Presti's seat, you've taken over as GM of the Thunder. Would you pivot toward, as you mentioned, the, the, the draft perspective and worrying about wins and losses? Or would you just play this season out and wherever you fall, you fall. The draft class is deep enough to not worry about it. Well, I think on one hand, it, it's a it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, right? I mean, you have Chet Holmgren, who will basically serve as a, a second first-round pick. that Because the Thunder only have, I think it's like their picks this year. They don't have anything incoming um, outside of like a, a – or maybe they have like a, a second-round pick. Yeah, they, they have their own first-round pick, and then they have the Wizards' second-round pick. That's what it is. Yeah, so I knew they had a high second-round pick. So in a way, you're getting a free pick if you want to look at it that way. You get a free rookie. Um, as a, an additional pick in this draft by getting Chet Holmgren back. So like, you know, you don't have to go all out, but wouldn't it be nice if you could get the chance at, you know, Scoot or Victor as well as getting Chet Holmgren, who I think, by the way, is going to be very good. Um, I think that would be really promising. But at the same time, like, I don't think they need to, I don't think they need to go all out on that because personally, I don't think the 2024 NBA draft is going to be that great. I've been underwhelmed just by the 2023 recruiting class. Always felt it's been a little bit underwhelming in top end talent. And the Thunder are probably going to be a team who I think they compete for a play in fully next year. Barring health, of course, it's always an obstacle, but like you can say that for all 29 other teams. I think they need to start winning and they will start winning next year. And they already have loads of first round picks next year. If they, I'd say just ride it out because you can just move those picks back into this year for the draft if you're that desperate to get a better pick. That's a, that's a good point to write it out and kind of uh, see where you stand. Now, let's talk about this 2023 draft because there are so many names that I love in this draft. And that's that's an interesting tip that you gave the listeners as well, that the 2024 draft class is not shipping up to be uh, to be the 2023 class. Is it kind of like the the uh, 2020 class where it's like, I don't even know who's the number one overall pick. Could it be Ant? Could it be LaMelo? And everything else is just kind of eh. I think, I mean, I think it's like 2021 with everybody knows it's going to be Victor the same way. Everybody knew it would be. Kate. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I meant 2024. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're good. I I, um, I I think that's what it's going to be like, though, is you can debate who is number one on your board. There's no debate on who's going number one unless like Victor. I mean, knock on wood, he's been healthy. Like that's that's literally been the knock was can he stay healthy? He was for the last two years. He was missing a lot of time here and there. If he's healthy, what's there to overthink? Like we've seen him do it stateside we see them do it they overseas and he dominates like there there's no question if everybody in the class hits their ceiling which like if it comes down to the top five picks it's kind of where you're going off of there's no doubt victor Wembanyama. yeah it is to clarify as far as this draft class goes absolutely it's victor number one you can only get victor manana by winning the lottery you can't trade for him no one's going to pass him up the thunder the, the Thunder, the Pelicans, the, the the Jazz, every team that has these massive amount of picks, even if they gave them all away, every single one of them that is eligible to be traded, the team that wins the lottery would not trade Victor Mignogna for all those picks. So, yes, this year's draft class, I think it's pretty solidified one and two. I don't I don't really see a team um, passing up Scoot either, but that's less of a sure thing than the Victor thing. I, there's no team on planet Earth that would win the lottery and turn down Victor Mignogna or trade him at all. So, yeah, I think that this year's draft class is defined, but this year's draft class is also very deep. And I want to start this next segment talking about Cam Whitmore, who is my uh, favorite non-Victor scoot player in this draft. But first, I want to tell you right now, my good friends over at Turo. Turo is incredible, folks. It's the largest car sharing marketplace that there is. With Turo, you can book any car you want whenever you want it from a community of local hosts across the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Australia. Forget boring old rental cars and find your drive at Turo.com. And, and, and the thing here is, with Turo, what you can do is you can find any car that you need for any occasion that you need it. So you can go with the classic car or even a luxury car for a special event, birthday, holiday. You can also go get a pickup truck if you have an errand to run, a minivan if you need to take the family across country, whatever the, whatever the situation is, Turo has you ready to go and can get you from A to B uh, with affordable economic cars for your budget. And just go test them out today and, and see what you like at Turo and you let them be there for you. Terms and conditions apply, obviously, but forget those boring old rental cars and go find your drive at Turo.com. 
We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast. On the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Here with Mavs Draft on Twitter, Richard Stamen, host of Lockdown NBA Big Board. Make that your second listen today as we begin to talk about this 2023 NBA Draft class. Thank you so much for making Lockdown Thunder your first listen. We're here for you each and every day talking Thunder basketball, this time with a draft perspective. And Richard, oh my goodness, Cam Whitmore. I, I He's 6'7", 232, 18 years old. He's only put in three games so far due to injury. And in those three games, he's averaging 15 points per game, five rebounds, 50% uh, percent from field goal, 35% percent from three. He's from that Villanova system, which we know without Jay Wright, you know, we'll, we'll see what it becomes. But for right now, the reputation, of course, is developing an incredible uh, professionals uh, at the NBA level and beyond uh, and, and outside of the NBA as well. Just professional players that you're going to want to have on your team, smart basketball players as well. Synergy grades out Cam Whitmore so far, again, only three games, as a very good defender. Where do you fall on Cam Whitmore? Because I am incredibly high. I have him third on my big board, and I don't foresee that changing. Uh, you know, Of course, you want to keep an open mind and, and allow yourself to adapt as the process goes along. But as of right now, I don't see how I'm ever going to come off of Cam Whitmore being my, being my number three. But where are you at on Cam Whitmore? Yeah, I, I haven't seen a full game of him yet at Villanova. I watched him all throughout the FIBAs, though. Um, just unfortunately haven't had the time just to dive in and focus on Whitmore just yet. But I have seen a lot of clips like on Twitter. I've done some searching and stuff, seeing what's up. And my goodness, like his ability to to hit shots over contests, that that's a lot of I know I saw somebody post a clip about the Boston College game and like that's special what he did there. It was just scoring at all three levels. I think he can hit the pull up. I and mean, in the FIBAs, he was really doing it as a creator. I was interested to see how he'd do it at Villanova, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if he can be that first option. And let's be real, Cam Whitmore might save Villanova's season. Like, he might be the saving grace. Like, like they were falling hard without him, and and obviously without Jay Wright, but he could really save their season, and that's big too. Like, if you prove you're a winner in that regard to NBA teams, it's massive. Yeah, Cam Whitmore, I think, is perfect for OKC. He can splash the three on the catch and shoot, which is going to be great for K for SGA driving kicks and Josh Kitty, his ability to set the table for guys. And also, as you mentioned, he can create his own shot, which look at this Thunder roster right now. Now, granted, they're going to add Chet Holmgren back, who can do a little bit of that himself, obviously. But look at this roster right now, and the only other player who can, or at least right now is even attempting to create their own shot, is Lou Dort, and that's of course not going very well for him uh, at all. But he's he's the second most aggressive offensive player the Thunder have right now, and to to move him down that pecking order makes him better, makes the team better, and the Thunder just need other guys who will be aggressive, and, and you can stagger with SGA to survive those non SGA minutes. Uh, so for me, I think that he's one of these guys that is uh, huge for OKC, and, and we're going to talk about a couple guys that I think is going to be are, are going to be perfect fits for OKC. Our next guy we're going to talk about is Brandon Miller, who I think is another perfect fit in Oklahoma City's game, more so than any other team, I think, for Brandon Miller. But what are some of the pros and cons of Whitmore's game for you? As as we kind of what, what should we be looking for as the, as the season progresses in conference play? Yeah, I want to just see what his defense looks like. I think he's somebody who in the FIBAs he was defending well. I never really thought it stood out as high level, but I also never saw him stand out as bad, which I think if you're neutral, that's a win on defense. Generally, like as long as you know what you're doing, you're not making mistakes. That's a big enough positive, like being an off ball defender, just not being lost, things like that. But also just how can he create his own shot at the rim? I know it, the three point shot is more what I see the shot creation at. And he did it in like one of the very weak competition games in the FIBAs where he was going to the rim a lot. Um, but you know, outside of like two dribbles, I didn't really see him go to the rim. I want to see what he can do. Start high pick and roll, go to the rim, attack the basket kind of thing. I'd love to see that. If he thrives at that, it's over. I mean, he's a top five pick. Cam Whitmore is one of my favorites, but let's talk Brandon Miller, another guy who I think is perfect for OKC and another guy whose synergy grades is a very good defender as of right now, shooting 43% from three, which of course the Thunder need three-point shooting on this roster, and you see whenever Isaiah Joe's in the game that the Thunder just operate better whenever they have shooters on the floor. And you're going to add a guy in Chet Holmgren who shot 40% from three back to this year's roster and, you know, next year. Then if you supplement that with a guy like Brandon Miller or Cam Whitmore or Greedy Dick who can all shoot, 
you then add two shoot shooters right away to this team to make them function better, which is going to tie back into what you said earlier, where it makes the Thunder a lot more competitive uh, than they already are, which they're already playing pretty competitive basketball. 18 points per game for Brandon Miller, 6'9", 220 pounds. And would you say that his biggest weakness is the uh, is his inability to create for himself as of right now? Yeah, I'd say really the two-point scoring scares me. Like right now it feels like he's just a shooter. Um, you know, after seeing how Jabari Smith has started the season, it's a little bit worrying. Like, I mean, he's been good. I want to emphasize Jabari. Like for anybody who's like going to pull that out of context and like – and I realize I didn't even give it context, so I, I get it. But, like, I want to emphasize Jabari Smith has been good. But, like, let's be real. Has he been a top three rookie this year? Absolutely not. His three balls not falling. And because of that, offensively, he's been very limited. And I think there's red flags like that. Uh, I ignored them last year. I still think Jabari will be good. But I've sidetracked it. The two-point scoring for Brandon Miller is alarming to me. And so it's funny that you mentioned that. I wrote about uh, college basketball players to watch on thundersintentions.com right now, uh, today. And so you can go to thundersintentions.com and read that article. And in there for Brennan Miller, I put that he has a lot of the Jabari Smith effect where last year, you know, is very high in Jabari Smith. And that came cratering down at the start of this NBA season. He's turned it around a bit recently. But I think that that is situational in the sense of, I think that if Jabari Smith Jr. was at Oklahoma City and he's getting the benefit of the gravity that SGA has going to the rim, where there's four guys in the paint and you're kicking out the Jabari Smith wide open at three, like all of a sudden then those shots fall and his averages look better, his game looks better, he's playing good defense in a, in a good team-style defense that the Thunder play, which which allows them to be a good team defense for the majority of last season and for some of this season as well. You know, I think that Jabari Smith looks a lot better in Oklahoma City. I think that Brandon Miller would have the same effect. I think that he'd look much better in Oklahoma City, playing alongside SGA, playing alongside Josh Giddy, then he would look in almost any other environment for his game, just due to those deficiencies at scoring at the two and kind of creating for himself. You know, I think that Brendan Miller could be a guy that is a perfect fit for OKC and maybe not a fit for some other NBA organizations. Yeah, and for him, I think toning down some of the shot selection issues would be better in Oklahoma City too. Uh, I, I just I like that fit a lot. I'm a little bit down on Brandon Miller. I say this as I, the last game I watched for college basketball was against Houston, the Alabama upset, which um, I don't know how to say this nicely. Brandon Miller was not a contributor in that game. Like that was not because of him at all. He was 0 for 8 at two turnovers, something like that. It, it was, it was just not good. I was very unimpressed and against, and for me, like I try not to just go, eh. Yeah, I try to be like, it's one game. Like, you know, we have six, seven other games, eight, even, of sample size to say like, okay, that was clearly a fluke, but he's been trending down a little bit since I think like the, the want to see North Carolina game in the PK 85. And I don't know, there's just some flags for me where I'm like, maybe let's, let's cool it a bit and see what he can do. But if he's going to struggle against Houston, like Houston game planned him, I think the same way that NBA teams would against him. So like, to me, that, that is a very translatable bad game. And with Brandon Miller, another knock on him becomes the age. He's a 20-year-old freshman, and that kind of ties into Terrence Shannon Jr., who I think that we've been hearing about for eons now. And he's 22 years old now, playing uh, transfer from Texas Tech, now playing with Illinois. What is your thought process on age whenever you're evaluating these prospects? How much do you knock or don't knock these players based on that age? Because I think that the Thunder have kind of fall has kind of shifted their thought process on that a bit because you know it used to be, oh give me Terrence Ferguson. He's an 18 year old mystery. Oh give me all, all these other players. Whereas they're giving away, you know, Basley, Basley and Ferguson, the two big ones that were young, did not play college, kind of a huge mystery. And you gave away in the Baisley trade, Brandon Clark, who turns out to be a really good player. You pass up OG and Anobi in the in, in the Ferguson draft, and you know it's just. I think that the Thunder now have shifted that to where they're drafting Wiggins and Jeremiah Armstrong, and they're drafting these guys that you know maybe have an age knock on them a little bit entering the draft, and they don't really care. They just they just care about good basketball players, and so I think that the Thunder have changed on that. But how do you view the age factor in all of this? Well, first of all, let me tell a little bit of off-topic story here. So I was Googling. I couldn't remember when Brandon Miller's birthday is. So I Googled Brandon Miller basketball, knowing that it's a common name. And he is 43 years old, apparently. Uh, I saw so that earlier, too. That, you will get the wrong person. I looked. I just, I'm sorry if you saw me laughing. That's what I was looking at. I was like, this man is not 43. If he is, honestly, it's impressive. But, um, yeah, he just turned 20 years old. For me, with, with age, it depends, right? Like a 20-year-old, I, I think – Brandon Miller's situation being 20 and playing in the SEC is a lot better than the Thompson twins who will be 20 playing high school competition. That's scary. Like 
that is a red flag where it's like, okay, let's easily talk on like how easily this translates. We'll maybe talk about the Thompson twins at some point, but you know, that they're flags. Now the other end of it is not every 18 year old gets better naturally. Like you kind of said, Terrence Ferguson, just because you were 18 does not make you inherently better upside. Like skill makes skill plus age gives you upside. An 18 year old who just picked up a basketball for the first time is not a better prospect than a 23 year old who like, or really 22 year old. Let's use that example. Uh, Cause in 2020 that actually happened. There were freshmen that were picked that had no idea how to play basketball that had of Desmond Bain. And, and obviously you'd rather have Desmond Bain, even though he was a bit older. So to me, it's you got to balance it. Like somebody who doesn't know who has like a fatal flaw in his 18, I'm going to be way less high on them than a 20 year old who, and even if they're a freshman, if a 20 year old has like all the skills in the world, like we see it all the time. And also, again, just age isn't equal. Not every 18 year old plays the same way. I mean, for, for example, there are three 20 year olds in this class that I view at a high level. Brandon Miller's a freshman, Mike Miles is a junior. And Eamon, Eamon and Osar Thompson are 20 years old. And I think Mike Miles is the youngest of all of them. And I, I think that with the age factor, like the, the Desmond Bain one is is the real kicker. Like he he only dropped because of his age. And it, it looks silly now looking in retrospect, like how good he is for Memphis. And you imagine all those teams that passed on him, like how much better they'd be with Desmond Bain. We're going to talk about the Thompson twins because I find that fascinating, both from the age perspective that you're talking about, but also just – how on earth do you begin to evaluate uh, the Thompson twins being, you know, being um, on overtime elite? But first, I want to say right now about our good friends over at Bet Online and Richard. Bet Online is the number one source for sports betting, stats, news, and analysis. You can go easily to Bet Online where the game starts to go to betonline.net and boom, you open up their sports book. You can bet on pro and college football, pro and college basketball, uh, golf, hockey, soccer, martial arts, anything that you want, tennis baseball, whatever you want to bet on, you can bet on there. And so, Richard, let's go to basketball, and let's see. The best game on the docket tonight, it's always fun when the Lakers and, and Celtics get together, but I think that the Kings and 76ers could be a very, very good game. The Kings are five-point underdogs in Philly. Where do you lean on that game? Well, if Fox is playing, uh, then I, I might take the Kings, but um, I know he's questionable. I, I do have a hot take, though. I think the Lakers are going to win that one. It's a so schedule loss for the for the Celtics third game in four nights on the opposite coast. Um, I think I think actually the Lakers win that. But I could the be Lakers. Over. If you want to go with Richard's opinion, the Lakers are plus three and a half uh, against the Celtics. Now, talk about a game that you can actually bet on. I just realized we're going to post this on Wednesday. You know, a game that you can actually bet on is the Thunder and Heat, which the Thunder tonight yeah. at home are a three point underdog against Miami as they open up their seven game home stand in the Paycom Center. Well, who are you leaning towards there, Richard? Do you really trust Miami right now? Like, they scored, what, 90 points in a win against 92 or something against Indiana? Like, OKC is going to win that. <laughs> I think I think that's a no-brainer. There you go. It's a lot. I might be an idiot, though. Like, like, I have a 60-something percent success rate. If you've seen Anchorman, like, I mean, I guess that's 100%. But, like, I don't know. So, I, I'm very confident in Oklahoma City. Sorry to, to hijack that. No, I, I love it. It's a, it's a Richard Stamen Thunder Draft lock on the Thunder versus Heat tonight. Go to Bet Online right now and check it out uh, at BetOnline.net, wherever you can access the internet. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network. Your teams every day. I'm your host, Ryland Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. We're joined by Richard Stamen at Mavs Draft on Twitter and host of Locked In NBA Big Board. Make that your second listen. Thanks for making us your first listen. Subscribe for free across all podcasting pl- platforms so you never miss an episode. Now, Richard, let's end the show talking Thompson Twins. My big question is overtime elite. Like, how do you even begin to evaluate them? I think that we still have not figured out the perfect formula for evaluating all of the G League Ignite talent, much less now factoring in this weird, you know, combination of overtime elite teams and leagues and whatever this is. Yeah, it's tough. Um, I think the best way is unfortunately something that's unavailable to, to people like you and me, which is you have to have like major Intel. I think having ends with the coaches, things like that and, and the staff and knowing what players are truly working on and where they really do stand. It's where pre-draft workouts are going to help. Now, all of that being said, I think there's very clearly two prospects that are above 
everybody else right now, which are the Thompson twins, right? I think Amen is going to be the best, the better of the two. Uh, I'm a little bit lower on Osar, uh, and I'm still not 100% sure I'm saying his name right, but there are things to like. My question is just, I mean, they're going to be 20 in three weeks, four weeks, something like that, uh, actually over a month from now. But in January, they haven't played o- against over high school competition, but in the basketball tournament. And none of those guys are in the NBA. So, like, my question is, is how do they translate? Like, we we do not know. I I think that that's the biggest red flag for me. I, I like the Thompson Twins, and, and you mentioned Eamon is my favorite as well of the two. Uh, I'm still interested in them. I, I still don't think that whenever I say red flag, don't perceive that to be, like, stay away forever. I just think that as of today, and, and really, as you mentioned, until we get to the combine, until we get to – hear more info from teams and agents of how these draft workouts workouts are going uh, way, way in the future in June and July. I, mean, I should say it's such a, you know, June and what's the month before June, May, May and June or whatever. Uh, until we get to that point in the calendar, we're just not going to know because of course these guys are going to dominate high school level competition. And do you, and, and it'd be silly for us to make these conclusions on 20 year olds playing high school basketball. Yeah, and in that way, you kind of have to rely on the combine. Hope, I mean, I don't even know if they'd play there, but things like the measurements and then also any word about pre-draft workouts. Like, I mean, being, again, just being on the inside of this helps a lot more. I think it's a clear picture. You just kind of have to judge them as a raw talent. Somebody here, you're like, all right, here's what his very raw skills are. How is he as a ball handler, a shooter, defender, and passer at like the simplest levels? And kind of guess, like, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, nobody wants to say they guess, but like we're all guessing in a way and not to be like not trying to be, you know, like uh, like meta or something. But like really, at the end of the day, this is a guessing game. You don't know what will and won't translate. Kind of you got to just take a chance and say, all right, he has enough raw skills like for either of them. We're willing to take the chance or we're not like there may be some fatal flaw that they see in practices. We'll never know. Um, I think, again, I would take a gamble on one before the other, though. I'm just so interested to see how that plays out, because, I mean, you mentioned it. It's going to be a guessing game from for almost every draft pick that you make. But let, let's just say, of course, Victor and Scoot are going to go one and two. So you're starting at three. Do you feel more comfortable if you're a GM and your job's on the line with every decision that you make? Do you feel more comfortable going with the Thompson Twins? You've only seen play high school competition, and sure, you can get a good feel for them in pre-draft workouts and uh, whatever the case is. But you know, truly, you've only seen them play high school high school level talent. Would you feel more comfortable with the Thompson Twins or Nick Smith Jr. or Brennan Miller or Kim Whitmore or Keontae George or Anthony Black or Grady Dick or you know whoever the case is? And, and, and there's a certain cutoff where those guys just do not have the physical upside, you know, as yep. as Thomas as the Thompson Twins do. But does that push the Thompson Twins from maybe being selected third to being selected sixth or seventh? Right? Like, like where where are you at in their draft range right now? If you had to make the call, yeah, I think there's two teams in the league that maybe three that if they got the third pick, they would take him. And it's only because none of them have anything to lose with it. If Orlando gets it with their pick and they have the Chicago pick as well, top 10, kind of like they did in 2021 where they took Suggs and Franz, they could do it. New Orleans could do it because they have absolutely nothing to lose uh, getting that Lakers pick. And then if the Jazz do it, like, I mean, depending on what happens with them and the Wolves, they could afford to, to go with one of them and take the chance. But if you're any other team, like, and this isn't to say college players don't bust, but like high school players bust too. And it's just general bad practice on anything in life. If you have a big decision to make in your job to do something that there's less available research on and go confidently into that pick, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So I think it's a massive risk, especially if you're already turning downwards. Like if you've missed a pick in the last two years, like say, for example, in 2018, when the Kings missed on Vladi, like there was a lot of pressure to hit in 2019 and 2020 um obviously they made some changes but you know that stuff matters like your your room for error is very very slow or very thin right I, I, it just scares me to take them to, to put my reputation or whatever on them however as you mentioned we're, we're gonna have to just wait and see how it unfolds because we're not gonna you know uh, get to you know see how, how they're performing in those workouts but we can hear from agents and from other sources of of how it ends up going. But I think this is going to be so interesting to watch them progress and hopefully they play in summer league and hopefully they play all rookie year. And of course we're rooting for them to succeed. And I think that Eamon will be a very, very good player. And if the thunder or whoever ends up with Eamon Thompson, I think that it's going to be awesome to watch them play. It's just scary. 
And sometimes in life, you got to do something that's very scary and it pays off. And sometimes it doesn't. So like, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Whenever I say red flag, like I still would like the Thunder to draft him. It's just hard to, to go on that leap. It's, it's really just about if you are risk averse or not, if you want to take the risk or not in your everyday life as of right now, because we are so much in the dark. Now, NBA teams aren't going to be that much in the dark, but we are right now in the dark on how good or bad they actually are. The Thunder did pra uh, practice at Overtime Elite whenever they were on the road trip in Atlanta. Uh, I don't think that they were able to see, obviously, the Thompson Twins. I think that the Thompson Twins weren't there. It was just the Thunder using the facility and then leaving. But still, they have to see the facility that they're practicing in uh, as a little minor note there. But Richard, thank you so much for joining us and let the people know where they can find all your stuff and also what you got cooking on the Lockdown NBA Big Board Show. Yeah, I appreciate it. Twitter's the hub for now. Um, who knows with the future? Uh, and that's at Mavs Draft. On Instagram is where I'm trying to grow uh, my more following and post more in-depth videos. That's at NBA Draft Film. Um, I usually just use those two in, on TikTok at Mavs Draft, but uh, it's a little bit behind right now. But feel free to follow as I get on, along there. But on NBA Big Board, I mean, we're doing a lot of fun stuff. We're doing rankings, comparisons, uh, and not necessarily like player comps, but like, you know, uh, fun little comparisons across several drafts saying like, who's this, you know, the Herb Jones of this draft, things like that. Uh, we got a lot coming up though. It's really fun. It's a lot of fun to listen to. Make sure you go checking that out for your second listen. So subscribe to both shows on YouTube and also wherever else you get your podcast from as well. Richard Thunder draft. Thank you for joining us on today's show. We'll talk again soon uh, as we kind of get into draft season. Now as conference play begins, March Madness around the corner, and pretty soon we'll be tweeting out draft workouts and, and keep up to date on the tracker of who all the Thunder and other teams have worked out. So, Richard, again, thanks for joining us. Until next time, be good and be good to one another.